So James Wilcox, can you introduce yourself and tell us exactly what you are doing in life at this point? Yeah, kia ora, Nick. Um, so everyone, my name is James Wilcox, as Nick rightly said. I'm the project director for Predator Free Wellington. So it's probably the, the easiest way to explain it is the, the chief cat herder, if you like, in terms of keeping all of these different facets of the project together and, and moving in the same direction. Just wanted to say a, a quick shout out to you all for tuning in today and hope everyone is, is safe and happy out there in these uncertain times. And a big thanks to PFNZ Trust as well for putting on this um, this really cool, cool opportunity. So, yeah. Can you give me a bit of an idea of, just while we're building up to the presentation, can you just tell me about yourself, um, how you got from, uh, you know, I think it was Rotorua where you were born, is that correct? Yeah, that's right, Nick. So I am uh, a Rota Vegas boy, born and bred in the, the lovely cultural hub of our fine nation. And I guess I was I was lucky enough to grow up on the fringes of Whakarewarewa Forest, so I was in there all the time. I had incredible parents that um, enabled me to do all sorts of things like get into fishing and into diving and skiing. So, you know, that gave me a real affinity for the amazing things that that exist in this this country of ours. So, you know, I absolutely love New Zealand and and I was always going to be on the path of, of conservation to a greater or, or so. Nikai started my my work in this space back in Rotorua as a, as a dock ranger many, many moons ago and kind of rose through the ranks, I guess, and landed in, uh, in Wellington to learn a bit about national office and then get back into the field. But I guess, you know, that never happened. I, I fell in love with the city and met my wife and, and the rest is, is history. So uh, the last role I had with DOC was as, as the uh, national manager for volunteering. And then this opportunity around Predator Free came up and I just jumped at it because it's all around delivering on community based outcomes. And, and that's key for me. You know, that whole partnership space is just absolutely incredible. So I guess that's that's my journey in a, in a nutshell as to how I got to this particular point in time. That's a great intro, thanks James. And um, just on the video and sound, so watching the comments everybody, um, it's such a variation of uh, outcomes to you all around the country. Some people who have very fast internet are finding it very, you know, very good and some are not as far as they can hear it, but the a lag in video. I think that's just um, what happens with something like this. So we're going to continue on. Hopefully enough of you have nice clear sound. I would say turn up the volume. Don't pay too much attention to um, our faces. Um, and pretty shortly, we're going to put a presentation up in this box that our two faces are sitting on. And then James will take you through um, the uh, project of the Predator Free Wellington um, group and what they're achieving. So we might go to that now. So I'm going to, thanks James, going to move you and I um, slightly out of the way. And I'm, there we go. I put up a presentation, uh, bear with me everybody, that is actually uh, allows you to work to it and then we can all follow along with the great work that you're doing. Uh, hold on, here we go. And we'll present that in there and see if it comes up and we should all be able to see it. Away you go, James. Thanks very much. Yeah, kia ora, Nick. Um, so just a couple of qualifiers before I, I jump into this. This is my first webinar experience and I wouldn't profess to be anything like a, a tech guru so let's hope everything everything holds and we can move through it. Um, I do tend to get quite animated as well so sitting in front of a computer screen is quite a different prospect for me. I, I can't sort of dance around like I usually would so I'll do my best to keep in, keep that in check and I suspect the real value in this is the conversation at the end or the question so I'll, I'll move through uh, this presentation as quickly as I can. I promise not to, to bore you all with too much details. And as Nick mentioned, we'll we'll move to move to questions to questions at the end. So I guess in terms of just this first slide, this is around building some context to give you an, an idea of of the bigger picture around Predator Free Wellington. So some of you may have heard of our WE project, and I'm sure many of you you haven't. So I just thought I'd take the time to explain that first. So our vision is to create the world's first predator-free capital city. So by that we mean removing all possums, all mustelids, for us that's stoats and weasels, 
rats as well. So that's what we're about. And we see that occurring across five phases you can see there on your screen. So the model for us is remove and protect. So we want to remove these invasive predators and then hold a line to prevent uh, reinvasion. So that's that's the project in a nutshell. We see that occurring over 10 years, and that's 30,000 hectares. And as you'll note, it's got our capital city smack bang in the middle. So our context is, is super, super different. And where we're at at the moment is just wrapping up this first phase. So the first phase you can see there on the map is the Miramar Peninsula. And that's home to 20,000 people. So 20,000 people live on that peninsula. It's where they work, they play, and they move around every single day. So our strategy is, as part of this, really has two arms. And the first is around building this massive social movement. And we're doing that through backyard trapping. So we've enabled these backyard trapping groups where people can have traps in their backyard across 50 different suburbs in Wellington. So that's basically all of the suburbs. And it involves tens and tens of thousands of Wellingtonians. And that's an incredible start for us because it provides a really good knockdown of these species before we move in. The second part to that is, is kind of the technical element, I guess, and that's the eradication operation proper. So like I said, we've started in Miramar with our goal to completely remove those predators. And then our end state is to hand that back to the communities. So the the prize, I guess, is is perpetual vigilance to let us know if anything turns up. So, you know, we can't put up fences, we can't lock off these areas, and we wouldn't want to in any case. What we need to be sure of is that we can shut things down as soon as they may re-emerge. So that's really our, our strategy. And now I'll go into the focus on, on Miramar itself. So we started out with this incredibly sort of am ambitious goal on Miramar Peninsula to to, as I mentioned earlier, eradicate every last rat, every last stoat and weasel. Now, possums were removed off the peninsula in the mid-2000s, so that means we haven't had to focus on them in this first instance. And that peninsula and the surrounding area, and that smaller shot you can see, that's our barrier system. So it's called a virtual barrier system. It, it acts as a, almost like a virtual fence, if you like, with lines and lines of traps and other tools to try and intercept anything coming in. In a total area, that's around 1,200 hectares, or in sort of Kiwi speak, that's uh, a little over 1,200 rugby fields. In terms of our recipe, so all of the infrastructure we've got out on the ground, it's involved 4,500 bait stations, 2,500 double set .200 traps in a really long box, 900 mil long, 1,000 additional traps, about 13,000 detection tools. So that's these, these wax tags and chew cards that you can see here. 26 field staff going around and servicing that network every week for 26 weeks. And what that means is basically you could walk in any direction 25 meters and you'll see, you'll hit some of our kit on the ground. So, you know, it's physical presence is absolutely huge on the, on the peninsula. In addition to that, it's involved over 1,800 community traps, so predator-free Miramar, the backyard group, have got a whole heap of traps out there, as well as other groups like Tumutu Kairangi and Places for Penguins. And those groups meant that we were 5,000 rats down before we even started, so that helped with that really incredible knockdown before we'd even started the eradication. It's also involved hundreds of kilograms of peanut butter, so just a quick shout-out to our mates at Fix and Fog who produce luxury peanut butter, and they've given all of that to us for free. And look, fantastic to know that for these rats, they're getting to dine out on, on a luxury product as, and, and what might become their, their last meal. So the logistics to get all of that stuff out on the ground is absolutely huge. But to make that even happen, we needed over 3,000 individual permissions. So those thousands of dots you can see on the map, they represent people's homes, their businesses, public spaces, schools, playgrounds, our international airport, everywhere. So to enable this to happen, we had to really invest in engagement. That level of engagement is unprecedented. So it involved thousands of cups of tea, you know, that universal currency and, and community engagement, going into people's homes and, and sitting down with them. And we came across some really interesting people and really interesting interactions and you know, one of those was a person who wouldn't sign up, wouldn't give us permission to put a bait station and trap 
on their property until our community engagement officer went in and had a guitar jamming session with them. So after several covers of the Beatles, they then signed up and, and were happy as. And, and that's just one example of, of what we've had to do to enable this to happen. So our context in the city means that we've got this unparalleled opportunity to affect real social outcomes through conservation work. It means we're actively involved in people's lives. So it's not just putting everything on the ground. That's not what a permission involves. It also involves saying, yeah, I'm happy for someone from your team to come onto my property every week for six months to service these devices. So it really is about building trust. It's not just about getting those permissions so we could go and, and do the work. Our project success really, really does rely on Wellingtonians stepping up to do their bit. So whether it's getting their hands dirty, if you like, in terms of servicing traps um, or fielding lots of information coming in from them or monitoring for outcomes, our team of 26 field operators has turned into a team of thousands and thousands. And that's really epic. We've had people stopping us in the street to tell us that they're seeing piwaka waka in their backyard for the first time or kiriru in the trees or kaka flying overhead. And that's really, really cool. So the social outcomes for us are as important as the biodiversity outcomes or seeing our native species really thrive. Having the city on board for us is not just a nicety, it's absolutely essential. And I'll give you an example. So that gentleman there that you can see on the on the screen, his name is Daryl. He lives in a suburb called Strathmore on the Miramar Peninsula. So one of the, the lower socioeconomic areas of, of the city. Suffice to say that Daryl's had a plenty of challenges in his life. He's done some lags in prison for, for various things. And the reason why he got involved in Predator Free was because he couldn't sleep at night. So Daryl will tell stories about opening up his hot water cupboard and seeing dozens of pairs of red eyes stare out at him. So he first got involved by getting a trap from Predator Free Miramar, the backyard group, and set that in his house, and he caught 24 rats in the first two weeks. And that really started to show him the benefits. So he rolled that out further, got more traps, got his neighbours on board, other people in his community. So his energy and commitment really started building from that small place, that area. In terms of the operation, weekly trap checking and bait station checks meant going onto people's properties. And while we had 99% support for the project in terms of getting those permissions, not everyone wanted us on their, in their backyards. And that's really where Daryl came into the mix on this one. So his skills at being able to connect with his community, having built relationships over years, was absolute gold for us. You know, and this is a pretty rough area of town, to be honest. And he approached us about getting on board and he's been volunteering with Predator Free Wellington for over six months now. And because of him, we've been able to access areas like the Black Power Gang Pad, um, other social housing areas and, and marginalised communities that we just couldn't otherwise access. Someone like me couldn't just roll in there and, and you know, look to do what we wanted to do. So he, Daryl's just one of thousands and thousands of Wellingtonians stepping up to do their bit. And the point being, the motivations might be different, but the collective goal is the same. We've got hugely diverse groups of people stepping up to do whatever they want to do, and that is epic. You know, that whole collective action is really, really cool. So the project, it's great for the city. It's great for its people, and it's great for our native biodiversity. It's building resilient communities, and they're all united under the shared vision. You know, neighbours talking to neighbours about trapping, swapping stories about what bait works, all of that sort of thing. It's just amazing. And this slide's actually a title screen from a recent documentary that charts Daryl's journey and his family's journey. So if you haven't seen this, then, then please do. I'm sure we can circulate the link afterwards. It's only 17 minutes long and it's a, it's a really great investment of your time just to, to understand a little bit more about Daryl and his story. Of course, when you're stepping into the unknown and you're trying to do something that's never been done before, it means there's going to be an absolute heap of learning opportunities on, along the way. So we've really had to pivot, move basically on a, on a weekly basis, change what we're doing, change it up, go in a different direction. And as I mentioned, we've had our team of, of 26 field operators trawling over the peninsula for, excuse me, well over six months now. 
they know it intimately and they've handed out some really interesting nicknames for certain areas. So that big picture there is a place affectionately called Nappy Valley where our team have had to go in and clean up probably hundreds of nappies over, over the months. And that's really around minimising food sources and refuge for rats. That top picture in the corner there is of one of our field operators, Josh, and he's working in the area affectionately known as the bakery, where we had to go in and clear out about 400 slices of bread that have been dumped. Again, you know, that's a food source for rats. If that's around, they're not going to go into a bait station, they're not going to go into a trap. We've also had to negotiate with hoarders, people on home detention. That bottom photo is actually someone's property is on home detention and all of their rubbish, all of their food scraps was just going under their house. So, you know, these are the type of scenarios we've had to navigate continuously. And that requires quite a different skill set to your normal technical operator. It's not just about setting traps, servicing bait stations. It's about being able to have really meaningful discussions in the community space and build a shared understanding. We've also had things like an active construction zone. I mentioned our virtual barrier system. So there was a project building a new cycleway through there and lots of heavy machinery. So every time a roller or something like that went through that area, it would set off all of our traps in that zone. So we'd have to jump straight back in, reset those. And that's just, that's the reality of working in a city. It's not static, it's changing the entire time. So the learning here for us was really around adapting from a technical approach or a technical conservation mindset to one that puts people very much at the centre. So our biggest challenge, but also our biggest opportunity in respect with respect to this project is actually about us. It's about people. It's not about animal ecology. And if we have any hope of delivering the shared goal of a predator-free Aotearoa by 2050, and I really believe we need to start thinking about this differently. And also in the interest of being brutally honest, there's a reason why this stuff hasn't been done before, because it is hard. It's incredibly hard. I could go into a presentation about what's kept me up at night over the various months, but that would be, you know, something entirely separate. There have been lots and lots of, of sleepless nights for sure. So where we're at currently is mopping up the last shipwrats on Miramar. So with these, we talk about these in terms of cells, tiny little areas where we think that there might be some leftover rat activity. And each one of these cells has its own case file that we're going and repeating visits, making sure that we have a lag of about six weeks of no activity before we close that case file. And just to show you what the this mop-up means or, or what's involved when you're after every last individual. That photo there is what we call the tree of doom. So what's situated on there is one kamati trap, which is a certain type of rat trap, three ratabait strikers, a bait station with pallets in them, a victor trap, a chew card, a wax tag, a trail camera, and just out of shot is a T-Rex trap, another type of trap. So that's what it takes to get to zero. That is a huge amount of infrastructure in just one tiny, tiny area. As well as some of the challenges that we've faced along the way, like servicing all of the infrastructure in our international airport between the hours of 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., there's been some incredibly, some incredible positive learning in this space as well. And the biggest thing really for us is that in that learning space, we've found that people are amazing. So without the community deciding that this is what they want for their neighbourhood, for their suburb, for their city, this project simply wouldn't have happened. So we put the goal out there and enabled people to participate in whatever way they wanted. The commitment of our, of our community groups, so you know this isn't a predator-free Wellington story, this is a city story. And many of these groups have been working towards this goal for a long, long time. And we feel that we carry that, that mana associated with those groups and incredible individuals with us. In the terms of the people living on the peninsula, they are our eyes and ears. So we have dog walkers checking traps for us, people taking chew cards home that we, we put out in the library or through community centres to do monitoring in their compost bins, people reporting rat sightings or any activity out there. And what that means is we've got this amazing detection network of thousands of sets of eyes and ears out there and that's already in place. And ultimately, that is what the long-term success of this project is all about.
It's that shared responsibility to protect those hard-fought hard gains. As I mentioned, we can't put up fences. You know, we have one of our biggest risk factors is cars continuing peninsula. So if something shows up, we need to be able to respond to that incredibly quickly, and we're relying on the collective community of Miramar to let us know what's going on in that space. And look, this has become really pronounced in light of COVID-19, of course. So with the, the move to level four shutdown, we've had to cease some of our, our regular operations. So we are still able to go and service the virtual barrier system to prevent reinvasion, but we can't go and service everything on the same regular schedule we would. So to be able to put that call out to community and say, tell us what's happening in the, in the devices in your backyard, you know, get your trap out there, get going, let us know if anything's happening. We're fielding a lot of calls, emails, Facebook messengers every single day that enables us to keep a really good understanding on what's happening with our network and will also enable us to step straight back in into a current state when we get a de-escalation de in, these, in these threat levels. So the approach has been is really, really fantastic. And I guess in terms of an outcome space, because this, this is really, you know, we are doing this for an ends. In terms of an outcome space, what, what are we seeing? So this is crunch time for New Zealand's biodiversity. Many of you out there will be working in your own projects and doing incredible things. We, we get that, you know, we get that this is a really challenging time. These invasive species are munching through 68,000 of our native birds every night. And we're starting to see some incredible things on the peninsula, on Miramar, but also more broadly throughout the city. And this work is really built on a strong foundation of community effort you know, organisational leadership, and you can see our, our founding partners down there, Wellington City Council, Greater Wellington Regional Council, the Next Foundation, and PF2050. As well as that, you know, an incredible team, and I need to give a shout out to, to my people that have been working away through all sorts of conditions, the howling well Wellington Southerly or baking hot sun, they're out there every day. But we're seeing a difference. You know, we are really seeing the bounce back of our native wildlife, our birds, our invertebrates, our lizards. Our monitoring supports this. But what's even more incredible is people are starting to share their own experiences. So those shots you can see on that final slide have all come in from, from members of the public. So our Facebook presence is about 65,000 people and they're all sharing what they're seeing. You know, they've got this real sense of pride about being part of the journey and seeing some new things out, out there. So just to explain this, because you won't be able to see the text, but that first shot's actually of a kaka in the grounds of parliament. So, you know, that's our endangered bush parrot fluttering around, creating a ruckus in the grounds of parliament in our capital city. It's amazing. And shot is of a Rokawa gecko. So that came in on a sheet from somebody's washing line in Miramar, the first time they'd ever seen one. And that third shot there, that's of our kariaria, our native falcon. So, I think current estimates say there's about five or 6,000 of those left in the world. You know, incredible, incredible raptor. And that one's actually, that photo was taken of that car area sitting on a windowsill in the CBD in Bullcott Street on the fourth floor of an office block. It's just amazing. And that final shot is of a, of a shore plover that turned up on the beach in Miramar probably about three weeks ago now. So. Those are incredibly rare. There's only about 300 of those left in the world. That's like a takahe turning up on a beach in Miramar and tottering around the coastline. And this is our capital city. You know, this isn't on an offshore island or, or somewhere in the way back of beyond. It's absolutely incredible. Now, we, we've got a generation of young Wellingtonians growing up that know what a kaka is, know what a kareerea, a kakariki, a kereru, because they're seeing these things every day. And that's a huge reward for the collective effort, something that's absolutely worth it and something that we can be incredibly, incredibly proud of. Just in terms of, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. This last slide is just some of, the, you know, some of the comments we get through that keep building this whole kind of movement around Predator Free Wellington and through the social media channels. Um, I just, just put a, also put out a couple of messages around our communications channel. So obviously we've got Facebook, we've got our website, at, uh, which is pfw.org.nz, and our email is hello at pfw.org.nz. So that's just if you want to stay connected because we're 
you know, continually learning, continually sharing. And I think that's something that's really important for us to note as well. That's that's an offer out to all of the other groups doing amazing work out there, you know, and it's not to say everything we've done right. You know, we've got some certainly some bumps and bruises from our journey along the way. But if we can help others to to learn and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls, the the holes that we've stumbled into, then that's it's absolutely great. And if there are people out there on Miramar as well, then remember we've got our 0800 no rats number. If you're seeing anything out there, then uh, please let us know. And just to finally wrap that up, before we had the the, the COVID-19 level four not, uh, shutdown rather, uh, we were already part way along this process of handing back to the community. So we are just chasing down the final ship rats out there. We've had no evidence of Norway rats or stoats and weasels for a good few months now. So it's just this last part that's proving tricky, it's proving hard, but we'll get there for sure. Fabulous. Grab a coffee. I hope there's coffee in there. That's great. James, it's that's old. a brilliant presentation. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, we kept you talking the whole time. So we thought we'd do the presentation and then we'll just have a few things that might have come through. Um, just a couple of things. While you take a breather this for a second, um, thanks everybody for the way you're helping some of the folk that are finding it hard at the start to get sound and vision. Uh, it was lovely to see. There was one guy even said, hey, um, Tito, if you actually have a problem, here's my cell number, ring me and I'll talk you through it. A uh, great bunch of people. Um, thanks everybody who's attending. Um, and the questions have been coming through. I've written a few. Um, just Lynn asked, um, are you catching any stoats on the peninsula? No, nah, stoats really haven't been an issue. It's been the odd transient one coming in and then probably figuring out there's, there's no mates around. It's really been weasels for us and, and even those have been in relatively low numbers. Another question came through, but on motivation. Um, as a leader and, and from your opinion, point of view, because you're doing it, um, What's some of the traits that are working for you as a leader? What do you think the team leaders need to have uh, to motivate their teams through this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I struggle with the, the term leader. I, I think, you know, like I said, I see my role as chief cat herder, but what, what I really, what I think is, has resonated well is the ability to build relationships with diverse, diverse audiences. You know, that's, that's really key for us to understand where people are coming from and, and what might motivate them. And a good example is when we were going through the permissions process on Miramar and we turned up with our glossy two pager about biodiversity outcomes to areas with high refugee communities or different cultures, it went nowhere. So what we had to do was was quickly figure out you know what was going to work and that involved simplifying our message to a half pager that said no rats free service translating that into Samoan and Arabic and that's how we were able to get the buy-in so I think I think to answer that question it is really around relationship management you know communication and interpersonal skills we can teach anyone to use a trap to use a bait station that's fine but I think those other skills are are harder to develop but absolutely critical for us. It's not trying to force something on people. It's it's about understanding what are their motivations and how we can accommodate those. Great. Hey, just for people, that we are actually recording this. And for those who may have joined late or want to share it with somebody, we will be um, finding a way to put it uh, on, I uh, reckon, a YouTube link and be able to send it out to you via um, Predator Free New Zealand Trust. Um, we'll have all those details for you um, at the end. Um, cats, can you um, can you have a go at, uh, at cats? You've been meeting quite a, a lot of people, I imagine, along the way that have cats. Um, how are you dealing with uh, the questions they have about this? Yeah, sure. So the, the first thing I need to qualify is that cats aren't part of our our project that also we we align to the the national strategy if you like around possums rats and mustelids is the the three biggest impactors on our native biodiversity of course we live in a city and we live in a country where we have really high levels of of cat ownership but we need to keep a really tight focus um, about what we're doing so i mean we we support we advocate for res responsible pet ownership 
And then we're linked in with some of the programs that are happening through our partner agencies like Wellington City Council are doing fantastic work uh, along with the SPCA to, to, to understand how we may be able to mitigate some of those effects. And look, as it is, um, you know, we, we have two cats at home, we have two dogs, we have chickens and one fish. So um, it, it's it's something that, that I, un, you know, I understand, but, you know, we have to be really specific around what our focus is and the fact that what we're trying to do is never been done before we get through that, then that's fantastic. But, you know, cats is a question I get asked about, wasps, hedgehogs, the whole lot, and, and just being able to maintain that really strict focus is key for us. I suspect really the the question around cats is something that needs to be resolved in the community as well in terms of people deciding for themselves what sort of pets they want to have around and why. I don't think it's something where they can be can be or should be told what to do and what not to do. But important to have the information to make those decisions on that on that basis. And that will take time. Yeah. Absolutely, Will. Um, Edward asks, how can you use poison bait with dogs and cats around? Yeah, so that relates to really, really solid planning. And that's that's the huge kind of faith and trust that I put in my, into my operational team. So the way that we can use those is by having really good planning and an operational rollout to minimise any risks. So the bait stations we use, you need to have a lock to get into them. And they are also tethered to the ground. So they are bolted onto big stakes that are driven into the ground. So it's really hard to mess with them. You know, the, the block bait we use is on is on stakes. So it's really hard for any animals to get get any quantity of bait out. And we're only using a hundred grams. So we're not filling bait stations right up. We're only using a hundred grams, very small quantities, which would mean that any pets if they were able to rip into a bait station that was locked, that was tethered to the ground, they would need to eat the full contents of a lot of different, a lot of bait stations around the place. So that again comes back to having 26 field operators who are servicing this continuously. So we can ensure we have a constant supply of bait, but it's at very, very small quantities. It also means that we get, we, with those people going out the whole time and the community support, any any bodies that we come across of rats or um, rats or mustelids, they can be gathered up quickly so that risk of secondary poisoning in the environment is absolutely minimised. The other aspect to that, if we put toxins aside, our traps are in 900 millimetre long boxes, so that's almost a metre with offset baffles or entrance holes which means that it's impossible for dogs or cats to be able to reach in there and activate any of the trap devices. So if we were to uh, have any non-target catches, and that includes people's pets, cats, dogs, or children uh, fiddling with our devices, then that would break down the trust, the relationships incredibly quickly and compromise the whole project. And it's just worth noting that we've been operating, you know, that events, that density of thousands of devices for well over six months now and we haven't had one issue. So, you know, that comes down to really good planning, really good information sharing, being upfront and honest about what we're doing, and then having operational discipline to make sure we're holding ourselves to incredibly high standards. Great answer. Um, Kimberly asks, how do you manage biodiversity outcome monitoring using established tools like INAT or Track New Zealand? Question mark. Any learnings from this? Yeah, so we we uh, we tie into uh, a lot of the citywide monitoring done through our partner agencies. So Greater Wellington Regional Council and Wellington City Council. We use that mechanism of five minute bird counts. So that's been established across the city on a stand standardised grid with, with external contractors coming in and undertaking that work for, I think, over six years now. So it gives us really good baseline data. And we've also, the last two years, in fact, sorry, December last year was our third year um, of, of having a really tight grid of 200 by 200 metre um, five-minute bird count stations established on Miramar. So we wanted to be able to establish a clear baseline and chart the, the proliferation and abundance and distribution of our of our bird species. Uh, we also work really closely with Victoria University, and I've had some PhD students working uh, with with our skinks and geckos on Miramar. 
Hiramar is actually quite good habitat for skinks and geckos and just seeing what what's happening to those particular species in the absence of predators. Uh, we also have, I think through City Council, broader vegetation monitoring and those sorts of things as well. And then we have a whole series of, you know, the term citizen science, it's not a term I'm particularly sort of comfortable with, but there's a lot people can do in their backyard. So as, as part of our schools program, we set up wetter hotels and schools. Uh, we really encourage people to participate in things like the Great Kiriru Count and the Backyard Bird Count. And those things will be met through iNatural, iBird, those sorts of things. And we actually use that data as part of our reporting. So there's kind of, I guess my answer is there's a, a whole suite of things we do from the formal established through to people, things people can do in the comfort of their own homes. There's another question here. It said, for those of us involved in our own community backyard trapping groups, of which we know there's a lot of them um yep. how did you go about getting members of the community involved getting the word out she asks was it simply the door or other methods i think you covered a little bit of this in your presentation but can you just be help get an idea of how to do this yes i absolutely can and important to note that this this movement was had already started before you know my my time with predator free wellington had begun and really i think it was leaders in the community stepping up and wanting to do something and that and that grew the momentum some things that we've done in particular is not asking for someone to step up we've just enabled that space if you like for people to come up under their own steam if you like and say hey i want to do something in my community what what can i do and then for us it really was around ensuring they can get a supply of traps straight out so they can capitalize on on the energy and the enthusiasm and then some other things that we do to keep it keep it growing is we invest in building capability. And, and for us, that's really informal. That's getting all of our group leaders together a couple of times a year, having having talking about um, what's worked in a particular suburb. You know, if someone's trying to solve a problem, chances are someone over in that suburb's already done it. And that's a that's often a, a great space for people who might be interested in doing something actually coming along meeting other people and figuring out what it's all about the other thing that's really important for us is to be you know having having broken that organizational confine if you like we've been really staunch and and trying not to define how people can be can be involved and in, in what they do so not just the backyard trapping but other people other leaders to see themselves in the project and we've had artists stepping up to uh, develop predator free postcards we've had a group of university students getting street artists to do big murals on trap boxes i think that openness to allowing people to step forward as they want to and when they want to is really key without you know we have we never advertised for in fact we've done it once we've, we've advertised for a community leader to step up once and that really didn't happen so our experience was around conversations and see who's out there see who's interested and and go go from there it's got to be on people's own terms and it's got to be simple uh, from shan gilmore uh, what are the upcoming challenges as you move towards the next phase are there some things that are um, keeping you up at night <laughs> There's, there's many things that are keeping me up at night. And, and look, one of those is really around this expectation to deliver. You know, that's something that I really feel um, because I know that there are so many people who've been working a long time. So that's huge for me. Um, there, there are the use, and one of those would be funding. And, you know, that's particularly in this this. Um, post COVID-19 environment, actually security of funding through our, our foundation partners and those sorts of things who we enjoyed huge support from. And that's not just in monetary, but if you take the example of Fix and Fog with Peanut Butter, our, our mates at Double Vision Brewing who put on the Mirror Marvelous Festival, which was a bill with ourselves to um, to thank the people of Miramar. All of that, so that's a question mark for us, you know, challenging times ahead. Uh, aside from that, really it's, it's some of those technical aspects around 
where do we implement the next virtual barrier system and how do we hold that to stop things coming coming back in? Um, and just keeping this whole the whole movement going, you know, being being able to capitalize on the energy and enthusiasm, you know, the time is the time is right for us now. So um, I, I don't want to see that delayed. I've just seen a few um, techno over as well. There's one there around um, Brody monitoring and things. You know, want to send those through, then use that hello at pfw.org.nz and I can answer those directly because there's been a lot of work done in that space that we've been part of that I just haven't been able to canvas in this this short amount of time. So please, please feel free to do that. And thank you all. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, thanks, James. I think that is a really good point, everybody, that um, the groups, everybody is in this together. So everybody is open to helping in any way they can, which I think was proved today by the attendees helping each other. Um, stay safe, everyone. We'll see you next webinar. Bye-bye.